Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, I'm very glad to have with us Dr. Claire Magnani. Claire went to Harvard as an undergrad, where she obtained bachelor's degrees in chemistry and physics and worked in the group of Professor Andrew Myers. She subsequently came to Berkeley, where she recently completed her PhD in the Maimoni group after tackling the total synthesis of a very challenging alkaloid target. Currently, she works as a postdoctoral researcher in the Schreiber Group at the Broad Institute. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Claire. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Matt, for the introduction, and thank you for the opportunity to share my work on your platform. Today, I'll be talking about our deuromative synthetic entry into the altimocytin alkaloids, which is a total synthesis I worked on as a PhD student in the Maimoni Group at the University of California, Berkeley. Altimocytin is a monoterpene alkaloid with a dense and highly polar aza indane core. It was isolated in 1989 in a campaign to identify novel insecticidal and acaricidal compounds. Following this initial report, researchers at SmithKline Beecham Pharmaceuticals also identified the related alkaloids SB203207 and SB203208 while searching for novel microbial tRNA synthetase inhibitors. These compounds are closely related to altimocytin and are isolated with amino acid and amino acid-derived side chains. In SB203207, the sulfonamide side chain in pink is isolated with isoleucine, illustrated here in blue, and SB203208 contains additional isolation on the secondary alcohol with beta-methylphenylalanine, illustrated here in green. Preliminary medicinal chemistry work at SmithKline Beecham Pharmaceuticals showed that semi-synthetic modifications of natural altimocytin to append other amino acid side chains to the natural sulfonamide moiety conferred some specific inhibition of the respective tRNA synthetases. These findings support the hypothesis that altimocytin and its derivatives may act as amino acyl adenosine monophosphate nucleotide mimics. While the cytotoxic mechanism of action of altimocytin has not been reported, these findings by SmithKline Beecham interested us, and we were intrigued by the possibility that altimocytin itself could serve as an adenosine monophosphate, or AMP, mimic. Since nucleotide mimics have found success in the pharmaceutical industry as antivirals and immunotherapeutics, we believe the mechanism of action of altimocytin is worth further investigation. The electrostatic potential maps of altimocytin and AMP further support our hypothesis that altimocytin may act as an AMP scaffold mimic. Examination of these structures reveals how the unusual sulfonamide side chain may mimic the AMP phosphonate, and how altimocytin's bicyclic ring geometry adequately positions several polar atoms to effectively mimic the electrostatic profile of adenosine monophosphate. In our synthetic planning toward altimocytin, we identified four salient structural elements which we use to guide our overall synthetic strategy. First, we envisioned retrosynthetic cleavage of altimocytin's unusual sulfonamide side chain. We envisioned that synthesis of altimocytin's core in general would be a judicious target because it might enable us to append other side chains in future studies. Next, we recognized the latent tetrahydropyridine harbored in altimocytin, colored here in yellow which ultimately guided our overall deuromative strategy. The tetrahydropyridine is fused to a highly substituted cyclopentane ring, which completes altimocytin's aza indane core and contains an alpha-tertiary amine stereocenter. Lastly, we noted the seven heteroatoms decorating altimocytin's core. In contrast to prior synthetic approaches by Kende in 1995, and Fukuyama in 2014, which proceeded in approximately 30 steps each, we aimed to install nearly all of these heteroatoms within the first steps of the synthesis in a convergent manner. In this way, we hope to avoid the redox and protecting group intensive steps of the prior routes. To date, the enzymatic origins of altimocytin remain unverified, with the exception of the sulfonamide side chain, 
which Abe and co-workers showed originates from cysteine, while we suspect that an iridoid-like monoterpene is likely the source of the 10-carbon core. We were compelled to use simple feedstock chemicals in a net reductive dearomative assembly of altimacidin, rather than a nature-inspired oxidative approach. The recognition of the latent tetrahydropyridine harbored in altimacidin was also crucial to our disconnection, and we envisioned that this motif could arise from the hypothetical annulation shown on the right involving nicotinamid and an oxime building block derived from acetoacetate. With this synthetic blueprint, we envisioned introducing differentiated polar functionality rapidly while constructing the synthetically challenging alpha-tertiary amine stereocenter. In reality, in our forward efforts, the additions into N-methylated pyridinium salts were unsuccessful. This was likely due to the inherent instability of the resulting dihydropyridine product, which contains two reactive enamine moieties. This problem was abated by the use of chloroformates, which gave the corresponding N-carbamate dihydropyridines. The electron-withdrawing nature of the carbamate sufficiently stabilizes the dihydropyridine and avoids undesired enamine reactivity. After extensive optimization, we determined that phenylchloroformate was necessary to achieve selectivity for the C4 carbon over that of C6. We also found that use of trimethylsilyltriflate additive in 10 mole percent was key to this reaction. In general, past literature supports the idea that TMS triflate helps to pull the reaction forward by displacing the closely associated chlorine anion with a more dissociated triflate anion to produce a more reactive pyridinium. However, ongoing work in this area has shown that in some cases, direct activation of the pyridine with a silo group may be operative. Nonetheless, we were able to isolate our desired C4 adduct in over 77% yield on multi-decagram scales. Next, the allyl group was removed with palladium tetricus and dimethyl barbituric acid, which is highly nucleophilic and serves as a sink for the allyl groups. Other synthetic chemists in the audience may appreciate that in practice, executing this reaction required the addition of paranitrobenzaldehyde during the workup to consume excess NDMBA and convert it to the aldol condensation product pictured, which was easily purified away from our adduct by column chromatography. Otherwise, we found that the NDMBA tended to streak across our columns and coevolute with our desired product. Our efforts were next directed toward forging the key alpha-tertiary amine stereocenter. Attempts to utilize the dihydropyridine as a nucleophilic enamine in an addition reaction to the oxime pi bond failed, and led us to the realization that a dipolar cycloaddition strategy was required. Gratifyingly, microwave heating of the compound induced the requisite 3 plus 2 dipolar cycloaddition in 30% isolated yield. Improving the yield of this transformation was challenging because we found that the starting dihydropyridine had a propensity to revert to nicotinonitrile at elevated temperatures via a retroaddition pathway. Despite these low yields, we did make several efforts to move this material forward. In particular, we hope to achieve a diastereoselective reduction of the ketone by hydride addition to the more sterically accessible convex face. Unfortunately, the general instability of the tricycle product hampered these efforts, and we were unable to produce the desired alcohol. We reasoned that reduction of the ketone prior to the cycloaddition could potentially alleviate the problem of retroaddition, and that the incorporation of an additional sp3 center might provide a more optimal transition state for the dipolar cycloaddition. To this end, the ketone was subjected to sodium borohydride at low temperature to give the corresponding alcohol. This maneuver indeed turned out to give us a superior cyclization substrate to the ketone and provided the desired tricycle. The reaction was then telescoped through a second step by treatment of the reaction mixture with lithium bromide, DBU, in methanol to cleave the phenyl carbamate and give the corresponding highly polar tricycle as a single diastereomer. 
One notable aspect of the 3 plus 2 cyclo edition was its requirement of microwave heating. In further investigations, we were able to confirm that the z oxime isomer pictured is carried throughout the early steps of the synthesis. And so we propose that microwave irradiation is required to facilitate in situ isomerization to the reactive E configuration. Since the structure of this intermediate was highly crystalline, we were able to obtain the corresponding X-ray crystal structure and confirm that all of the stereocenters of the molecule had been correctly installed. Next, we tackled the direct and chemoselective reduction of the CO and NO bonds of the isoxazolidine in order to liberate the alpha amino stereocenter. First, several modifications to the isoxazolidine core were necessary. Acetylation of the structure with acetic anhydride proceeded smoothly and served to activate the NO bond for reduction. At this stage, we also took advantage of this necessary acetylation to methylate the acrylonitrile nitrogen, which remained free. This was accomplished by treatment of the bisacylated compound with sodium hydride and iodomethane. Methylation only occurred upon warming the reaction mixture from minus 30 degrees Celsius to minus 10 degrees Celsius. At lower temperatures, no reaction occurred, and at higher temperatures, we started to see significant undesired reactivity. As an added detail, this methylation turned out to be a fairly challenging aspect of the synthesis in practice because of the lability of the methyl ester in this intermediate. We found that the reaction was extremely sensitive to water, which rapidly hydrolyzed the methyl ester to the corresponding carboxylic acid. Our best reaction outcomes involved careful addition of a mixture of the starting material in crushed molecular sieves to a suspension of 90% sodium hydride at cooled temperatures, followed by the addition of iodomethane, which itself had to be dried over phosphorus pentoxide. Nonetheless, after optimizing these practical aspects of the reaction, we were able to isolate the desired precursor in 98% yield. An initial screen for the double reduction led us to molybdenum hexacarbonyl as an ideal reductant of the NO bond. However, under these conditions alone, CO reduction did not concomitantly occur. Instead, a dihydropyridine, shown in the dotted box, was found. After an extensive optimization effort, we identified that preactivation of the molybdenum hexacarbonyl in refluxing acetonitrile was required. This produced the active molybdenum trisacetonitrile triscarbon monoxide in situ, to which was added the starting isoxazolidine tricycle as a solution with excess sodium cyanoborohydride by hot injection. This order of operations was key to achieving high yields of the desired freedomine. Over the course of our efforts, we determined that the undesired dihydropyridine is not an intermediate in our reaction, since subjecting it to the optimized conditions did not produce the desired azaindane. Based on these findings, we propose that a transient iminium is formed over the course of the reaction, and that it's then reduced in the presence of sodium cyanoborohydride, but tautomerizes to the dihydropyridine in the absence of this additional reductant. With this key double reduction complete, we converted the nitrile moiety to its corresponding amide using palladium acetate and acetaldoxime in refluxing dioxane. And this was followed by extensive experimentation to remove the N-acetyl group, which proved labile only under strongly acidic conditions at elevated temperatures. The newly freed amine could then be isolated with the sulfonamide side chain, providing the ultimacidin ethyl ester. At this point, all that remained in the synthesis was conversion of the ethyl ester to the corresponding carboxylic acid. In a bit of an ironic turn, this ester, which had been prone to troublesome lability in prior steps, now proved exceedingly difficult to saponify due to steric hindrance from the newly installed side chain. Since the ethyl ester resisted all hydrolysis efforts, we turned to dealkylative procedures and found that lithium iodide in refluxing pyridine provided a path forward. Over the course of our investigations, we isolated and identified two stable isoxazolidine intermediates shown in the brackets. 
These isolated intermediates suggest that this challenging ethyl dealkylation is facilitated by the formation of isoluble oxazoline intermediates, which sterically disencumber the ethyl ester to permit dealkylation. Hydration occurs during the concentration of the aqueous reverse phase column fractions at elevated temperatures. Overall, altimocytin is generated in 67% yield in 11 steps from nicotinonitrile. That completes our synthesis of altimocytin. Thank you all for your attention. I also have my PhD mentor, Professor Thomas Maimoni, to thank, and the entire Maimoni group to thank. And thanks again to Matthew for the opportunity to share this work. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Claire for coming on to share your work with us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast. And feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.